Hi, welcome to the Fifth Estate Podcast. I'm Brendan. This is Joseph Lumpkin, our best-selling author and expert on staff. Um, he'll be joining us today, as usual, to take us through some religious history where we ask some questions. Today, we're going to focus on James and Paul, um, a pretty ordinary question in the faith, but uh, one that deserves to be expanded on. Uh, so, Dad, son. the most common, <laughs> you know <what>? I said son. <laughs> <laughs> the most common question is, um, you know, do Paul and James contradict each other? Uh, some people say yes. There are other people who give other explanations, but there seems to be a lot of nuances there. So, um, a lot of nuances. I think the uh, simple question or simple answer is yes, they did. So, um, the the question of the uh, of Paul hijacking Christianity, so to speak, has been around since Marcion's time, uh, first century or so, and uh, and, and it keeps cropping back. Uh, he was um, a leader of a uh, of a Christian sect. Uh, the the Marcionites uh, they begin about uh, 115 A.D. I guess, uh, and uh, Marcion believed that Jesus was um, did not really have a body. He, he was a spirit from uh, from heaven. Um, there was a definition or a delineation between the, the Old Testament God, the New Testament God in Marcion's mind. He, he basically said, uh, how can such a horrible uh, deity as the Old Testament God, uh, who basically said, you know, kill them all and I'll sort them out, um, be the same uh, God as the one that Jesus preached? Uh, so Marcion declared that the Old Testament God so the demiurge, which is a nostrum of uh, a deity that uh, was um, kind of malevolent and uh, and did not realize that he was not all powerful. He came into this world thinking that that he had created everything, which in in uh, uh, in, in their theology <clears throat> uh, he was not the primal cause of anything except uh, this world. And being the cause or creator of this world. And being quite insane himself uh, gave us what we're what we have around here, which is a world that is full of chaos, disease, disorder, uh, killing, maiming, all of that stuff. So uh, it, it answers a question. Uh, that theology answers a question: Why does good things happen to bad people? If God is so uh, benevolent, why do we have disease, killing, war, so on and so forth? And Marcion basically basically said, because the Old Testament God who created the world is uh, inferior and quite insane. And in his viewpoint, Jesus came to usher us back to the original uh, prime causality, the original uh, uh, God over the creator uh, of this world, if that makes any sense. So um, that was Jesus's plan in, in his case. Um, and he saw Jesus as uh, God, the, the, the true God, as being loving and merciful. And so he had a delineation. Now, the problem in that period of time uh, was uh, who is Jesus and what is Jesus? And in Marcion's uh, mind, Jesus was uh, a spirit. And therefore, so Marcion, the, sorry. No, um, go ahead. The Marcion seems, it, it, by that line of thinking, uh, Marcion would separate the Jews entirely from the Christians, right? They worship a different God. Um, was... Yes, he believed that the Old Testament God was uh, was evil. Yes, that is true. Now, the, on so the other side of that, was... say again? Sorry. I said, so we're not brothers in a Marcion view. Uh, correct, we are not. They are deceived, and uh, if we follow Jesus, we will go back to the God that created their God, actually. Um, their God was spun off of, um, of Sophia. So Sophia uh, was created by, who is wisdom. And if you look up wisdom in the scriptures, you'll see that uh, sometimes she appears as a person, a personage. And so their, their idea was um, 
uh, the the true God created Sophia. Sophia wanted to know what it was like uh, and wanted to be closer to the true God. So she created, which did not she did not have permission or power to do so. So the demiurge was born um, insane and uh, not fully functional. Interesting. It sounds yeah. a, a bit mythological, you know. Oh, the whole yes. Quite, quite, yeah. And it gets very in-depth and really twisted in their mythology. On the other end of that were the uh, Ebionites. And, and we believe that James actually was the uh, head of this sect. The Ebionite Christians were uh, Jewish Christians. Um, they were ascetic Jewish Christians that formed in Palestine. Um after the destru destruction of the temple. Um, so they believed that you must keep the Jewish law. See, if, if James was actually the founder or leader of, of, of that set, you can see that James in the scriptures believed the same thing that Jesus believed. Jesus was an, uh, apocalyptic Jewish rabbi. He believed that his message was the end is coming. Get out of politics, get out of the money search, get out of and, and clean your heart up and let's get the Jewish uh, religion straight again. So it's for the people and not for the Sadducees and Pharisees and, uh, and, and let's love each other and love God and move on without all of the, uh, accoutrement of, uh, of politics. So, um, so they were poor. Ibionite actually means the poor ones. And they followed the teachings of Jesus as he conceived him to be a Jewish apocalyptic teacher. So he's waiting for the end, but keeping the law. Jesus always kept the law. So if you want to be like Jesus, you want to walk in his footsteps then keep the law and go to synagogue and uh so that's what they did and we think that that james was the head of the temple or sect in jerusalem leading what became the ebionite christian okay so people usually point to uh galatians i think and Acts, the ones that say that uh, Paul and James don't contradict each other. Just to be devil's advocate here. Uh, well, yeah. They had meetings, <clears throat> so, I guess, and they weren't disputed, so go ahead. Yeah, they have meetings, but uh, he also goes on to say that he doesn't give a darn about what they think. Um, he actually, you know, actually says, uh, I, don't, I don't care what they think. So what happened, and, and keep in mind that the scripture have been rewritten a bit okay so if you go back to the historians of the time and there's about a dozen of them that wrote between uh well let's see i've got a list here let me just read them off to you if i can uh let's see here uh philo of alexander lived around uh, 30 bc clement of rome lived about 30 to 90 bc josephus 37 to 96 Ignatius 50 to 115, Papias uh, 60 to 135, Pliny 60 to 113, Polycarp 69 to 156. And the list goes on and on uh, of these people who are writing and reporting what's going on. They're historians. Um, you know, they, they might have an ax to grind here or there, like they could be Jewish or they could be Greek or whatever, Roman. So you kind of look at that bias, but these guys report that um, James the Just, which is James the brother of Jesus, was put over the sect in Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. And a, a couple of them point to the fact that Jesus himself had basically said, hey, you know, when I'm gone, do this or had given the direction directly to him. Um, 
Then Paul comes along, and keep in mind that Jesus died 30, 33 AD. He was born about 4 BC, so Jesus was born before the birth of Jesus, according to our calendar. There's a mix up there. So right. he died in, okay. <laughs> Can you expand on that? So the guy that invented the calendar, <laughs> the guy that invented the calendar made a mistake. There was a king, I think it was ordered Xerxes, that had two names. And so he calculated incorrectly. And in doing so, our calendar today is slightly off from what he considered or calculated to be the birth of Jesus by about four to six years. So Jesus was born somewhere between four and six AD. So that's okay. I mean, you know, neither here nor there, but Paul came in around 37 AD, several years after Jesus' death. The Jerusalem church had been up and running. At that time, there was about 7% of that population center that was Jewish. So, James is over this particular sect and he's keeping the law exactly like Jesus did. He's doing things like his brother demonstrated doing. Paul comes in seven years later and says, I had a vision and I know better than you do. Let's give this to the Gentiles. And there was a disputation. There, there was a dispute argument and Paul takes a uh, guys and, and, and they kind of split and he leaves. So no, they, they were not on the same track at all. Um, one wonders what Christianity would have been if, if we had continued along the James line, um, we would basically be a Jewish sect following a particular rabbi and his uh, philosophy and theology, his, his uh, teaching. And, uh, and the world would be a slightly different place. But because Paul insisted on opening up the faith to the Gentiles and telling them that they did not need to be circumcised or keep kosher or anything else, he just says, you know, Keep yourself from fornication. Don't eat things that are strangled. Um, then, you know, you'll do well. Um, that's a pretty light burden. And so these Gentiles begin to come in. Pretty soon, their population overwhelmed the converted Jewish population. And here we are. Yeah, um, it seemed to make sense, honestly, when I read it. Uh if you're going to recruit, you know, Gentiles, people following a different religion, it'd be easiest to recruit them with the feel good stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And not so much the law and order. Bring that in later. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my interpretation yes. of the argument between them. Like James may have sent him out, but you know, as any manager knows, it's trying to grow a business. You it's sloppy. You grow as best you can and then you refine. Right. And that's kind of what I yes. saw. I, I agree with that. Um, so the Ebionites, to go back to that, didn't believe in the virgin birth. Why should they? It was the brother of Jesus that was running the place. So it's not like Mary is going to be the perpetual virgin, virgin as uh, as the Roman Catholics would have her today. And uh, you know when there was a a line when Jesus was teaching and. Uh, guy comes running in and says, Hey, your, your mother and your brothers and sisters are out here. And he launches into a speech about who really is my brother and sister. And he it is basically, you know, uh, uh, comparing flesh and blood to the spiritual and, you know, keep my father's commandments and you're my brother and sister. But nevertheless, those were his brothers and sisters that were outside. They were, you know, trying to keep him from getting killed because he was, really revving up the people. And um, so, you know, there you go. Okay. 
So let me ask you something from a more political standpoint, I guess. Um, Paul ends up in Rome, right? We have the Roman Catholic Church, obviously, that was a pretty powerful organization still is today. Um, could that be why we uphold Paul and with such, you know, pristine or so prestigious? Absolutely. Uh, there's actually correspondence between churches. Um, if you call, I believe it's in Corinthians, where they had removed a couple of the heads of the churches and they were going to put other leaders in their place. Now, Paul says, hey, look, <clears throat> Jesus appointed all of these guys, including myself. Well, that's in dispute, but whatever. <laughs> and, and then we, in turn, appointed those guys that you removed. So following Paul's logic, they went against Jesus because Jesus appointed one, the appointed the others, they appointed the others. And so now you've got this line of apostolic um, uh, political power. And, and so they, they pled with this church to reinstate the ones that the Roman Catholic church at that time, the, the, the church at that time uh, had, had put in place. Now we, we find out that, the Roman church was playing a lot of politics. Uh, they had a lot of money. They were the seat of that uh, little uh, empire over there. And, uh, and they would call the churches and go, look, if you'll, if you'll do this and this, we will give you money. We will send you offerings and we'll help you with your church. But you've got to put these guys in positions of, of leadership. And so politically and economically, they strong arm these churches. And um, so, yeah, uh, it, it was a political, you would say, establish uh, authority and enough churches that at, uh, uh, in short order, the Bishop of Rome being known as the Bishop of Bishops. Um, and then in time, uh, gained enough political clout that uh, he made himself uh, Pope. And so that's the way that went. Uh, pope means father. Uh, and so you had a father of the bishops, and then we evolved to what we have today. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay, well... So there are obvious reasons for this, but I would like to get your answer. Um, I don't see a lot of preachers lean into that question, how you just did, you know, explain it from a historical perspective. It's a lot of, a lot of them fluff it up and basically try to say they agree, whether that's fluffing or not. Um, why do you think that is? Why can we not confront it? Oh, great question. Wow. So religion, um, <laughs> religion is partially based, the Christian religion, on the uh, inerrancy of the scriptures and um, <clears throat> following uh, lines of, of, uh, of order. So you don't want to disrupt, disrupt what is uh, feeding you whether it be spiritually or economically. And uh, so if you call into question um, how bishops or preachers or priests or whatever are called, um, then you call into question their authority. And if there's one thing that you and I know, it's that any organization, the first rule of any organization is to protect the organization and to uh, move it forward and to expand it. And so we, we have this self-protective, go into a ball kind of routine where we, we don't dare question the scriptures or, um, or the powers that be, uh, which is a shame. You know, I hear this a lot. The Bible is an inerrant word of God. Well, 
we have 5,000 different codices and pieces. And within those 5,000 different codices and pieces of the New Testament, we have 500,000 differences. There are more differences between the codices and, and uh, different pieces and parts that we have than there are words in the New Testament. So the first thing I think you have to say is, uh, which one is inerrant? And, and people will say, well, in the original manuscript, no, we don't have the originals. Look, Book of James was written about 44 to 49 AD, uh, Galatians 49, 50, Mark around 50, Matthew 50, you know, all of this. And then it goes down to where John, um, let's see, John was around 90, I think, one of the last books. Revelations around 96. Um, John around 90, 95. Jude around 90, 95. Hmm. Um, so not to digress too much, but you have to understand these guys, they, the people that really wrote them, they, they weren't the namesake. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nor does the scriptures claim that they do. They're, they're there by tradition. They're given those names by tradition. Now, more than likely, they were the, the, the students and followers or even maybe those students of students that uh, were with them. But then there was a lot that was rewritten in the long term to, uh, to satisfy the theology. So instead of going back and saying, this particular scripture says this and doesn't match my theology, so I've got to change my theology. They, they didn't. They, they changed the scriptures sometimes instead. Um, the Ebionites only carried the book of Mark around. It's the most Jewish of the texts, and it's the first one written. Uh, and in my gospel right here, it says, in the beginning, uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And there's a little notation there that says the, quote, Son of God phrase wasn't in most of the oldest texts. So they had a belief, and then they went back and they filled in gaps to substantiate their belief. So, uh, okay. There you go. So do you think that we were creating a narrative or do you think that we were just ignorant and trying to do the best we can? Oh, we're creating a narrative. Yeah. So. Now, sometimes we would dress it up just because it needed to be dressed up. We thought like, um, God, there's a, <clears throat> there's an entire list. This is between the uh, NIA and the King James. A huge difference. The NIE, I'm sorry, you broke up. NI, NIV, the NIV. Uh, the, um, the NIV translation. Yeah, Nancy. Yeah, NIV. So there's a lot of the scriptures that are um, not in the original that we have today in the King James. They there are additions. Some of them were additions because the scribe wanted to make things flow between the different scriptures in accordance to their theology. Sometimes they just dressed it up. For example, doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That drops off. You go back, it's not there. So if you look at, at a newer version of the Bible, it's usually not there. It ends with, you know, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. And it stops right there. Um, some scribe thought that it ended kind of flat. And so he dressed it up with this wonderful doxology, which we liked so much that we kept. Okay. Because what becomes trans, uh, tradition is usually kept in spite of the fact that people go, well, wait, we know that this predates this one and it doesn't have it in it, but this is so traditionally correct that we just keep it. Okay. 
So at one point we knew that this was incorrect and we just did it anyways. Yes. Yes. Um, grab yourself a um, New American Standard version and you'll see that some of this is missing. Uh, that's why when you go to a Catholic church and they said the Lord's Prayer, I always kind of like, I want that next sentence, but it's not there. It's not there. You know, um, they revised theirs uh, based on codices that were older and more reliable than the King James. No, oh, okay. So it drops away. Got you. Okay. Um, let's see. When did the uh, So, you know, we, we had some kind of rearranging of the text at some point, right? For, it seemed to put the Romans in a certain light. Yeah, yeah. Now, that happened upon translation to Latin, is that correct? The second time? No, we, we've actually had um, the books. You're talking about the books of the Bible? Yeah, yeah. When they, they just rearranged the order. And I think it, from what I thought, correct me, um, it happened in the Vulgate. Yeah. Um, okay, so Vulgate. you've got, for example, the Apocrypha. So, um, so let's let's get the Apocrypha for, for a second. Um, I've heard a lot of. Protestant preachers say that God was silent for 400 years between the Old and New Testament, between Malachi and uh, and Matthew, Mark, and John. That's absolutely not true. Uh, he wasn't silent. God's never silent. Um, there was a lot of things happening. The Maccabean uprising uh, happened for one, one thing. Uh, exists. Um, in historical context, only in the Apocrypha. Uh, there are a lot of things that are like that. Um, so when the Septuagint was being written, all of those things were being, you know, they had done, they had, they had happened. So uh, there were several books, Tobit, Judith, uh, uh, Ecclesiasticus, um, all of these things. And the Maccabees were, had been written and um, <clears throat> so they were put into the um, Septuagint. Some of them were. And, um, and so when Jerome translated the Vulgate, he brought those in. Now, they were not canon, per se. They were, it's called deuter deuterocanonical. In other words, a second layer or a sub-layer, if you will, of canon. Below canon, still accepted. Um, most people say, well, they're, they're there for your uh, enjoyment and uh, edification, but they're not to be taken as, quote, scripture, so to speak. So uh, so you have Bibles that contain them, then you have Bibles that don't contain them. During the Protestant Revolution, they, uh, they got rid of them in the 1800s. Uh, they dropped out of the, the normal King James. Um, at one time, it was illegal to print a King James Bible without the Apocrypha. But, of course, yeah. But go back to about the mid-1800s, and you begin to see uh, King James without the Apocrypha that the uh, Protestant church in, you know, embraced. Okay. Oddly so, enough, um, the G Geneva Bible is actually the first Bible brought to the U.S. Do what? I was just going to ask, is there a common theme as to why they would take those out? Um. Yeah, they, uh, well, you know, it's, it's odd. They say, well, they're not scriptural and they have errors in them. Okay, but the books that we have in the Bible have errors in them. And, and we keep producing more. Uh, even after we, you know, should have been able to say we've got it standardized, because uh, we have the printing press, uh, we continue to make mistakes like the adulterer's, adulterer's Bible, 
uh, read uh, thou shalt commit adultery. I forgot the knot there. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of little mistakes like that that are through history. So if you're going to say that it's inerrant, I, I think you have some qualifications to put in there. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So let me just ask you a personal question. Where uh, do you like how the story turned out? Do you think it would be better if we were the more orderly faith or, you know, is, is it was Paul the way to go? I know that can get in the weeds a little bit. It can. I don't know quite how to even frame it. I believe that we have misunderstood uh, from a lot of different viewpoints and vantage points. First of all, I'll, I'll, I'll take just to surface. If you want to study the Bible, it's probably best not to try to take it apart letter by letter, jot and tittle by jot and tittle, because these are letters, for example, th Paul's 13 letters, uh, 13 uh, books by Paul, only seven of which we think are actually authentically Paul. But these are letters written by Paul to a person or a church. Now, if I write you a letter and you know me, and uh, you're going to be able to know my intonation, my, my background, it's going to be a letter. And there may be mistakes made. Uh, I might make grammar errors, or I might make errors in spelling, or I might but you, you're going to know the basic part of what I'm trying to transmit to you. And we've gotten away from, from reading the Bible like that. We take it apart like we're surgeons. And we look at all of these little things and we make a big deal out of uh, this word or that word. When we should, I think, step back and say, what is he really trying to get across to us? That's the first thing. Second thing is, Let's assume that Paul did hijack Christianity. And let's take the Pauline letters out. And let's look at what Jesus actually had to say. There wasn't a whole lot there. You know, there's not a whole lot. Love God, love your neighbor, and keep getting up. You know, I, I say this a lot uh, in, in some of my uh, teachings. that If you broke down what Jesus actually said... Uh, it was all about um, perseverance. And, uh, you know, to, to Lazarus, he said, get up. Uh, to the daughter of the man, that uh, the daughter had died, and Jesus said, you know, get up. Uh, by your faith, you know, I'm telling her to get up. Uh, to the woman caught in adultery, you know, he said, get up, go, oh, sin no more. So his, his teaching was pretty simple. And, and absolutely dramatic. Um, show love, show compassion, feed the poor, you know, the hungry. Uh, get out there and do something. Be proactive. Um, you know, one of the greatest sermons, of, and it may be myth, but the greatest sermon supposedly given by a great rabbi was, if you are in here, uh, then you are not out there doing what you're supposed to be doing you know, love God and go help the people. And that was his sermon to the beginning rabbis of, of that particular class. And I think Jesus told us the same thing. Keeping in mind that Christianity at that particular time was a horizontal religion. It was grassroots. It was one-on-one -on -one in people's houses. You know, they were meeting and they were converting and they were helping and, and they were living. And, and even the Ebionites that came out of that movement, uh, but basically, they were poor because they shared everything in common and gave everything away to the poor. They did what they perceived Jesus wanted them to do. 
now we have a horse or now we have a vertical religion where power and money flow up the line. Uh, only 2% of the money that we tithe into any church gets to the field. There are churches that do better, churches that do worse. Oddly enough, the bigger churches tend to do worse. They keep almost all the money there for the dog and pony show. That's not Christianity. So am I happy with the way it turned out? No, I am not. I believe that we need to get back to one of two things. The desert fathers, the mystics, the ones that said, um, I am going to do this and search for the heart of God. And they transcended denominationalism. They could care less what you call them. They were just meditating and looking for God. And then you had the Ebionite type of religion, which is going out and living in a way that helped people. Um, the normal churches today, it's a feel-good session, and then you leave. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, I think we lost all accountability at some point. Mm -hmm. That might yes. have been the point. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. So, so uh, <clears throat> there's something to be said about apocalypticism, knowing that Jesus was an apocalyptic teacher. Somebody said, why didn't he write down anything? Well, if he really believed that the end was coming very soon, there's no need to write down a darn thing. Who's going to read it? Very, very good point. <laughs> and um, and so you know, I, I I lay that out there as just saying we have to look at what Jesus apparently believed, and he taught the soon coming kingdom. So there's something to be said for this viewpoint because it keeps you focused on um, on where you're going to be and what's going to happen next. So if you truly believe the end is nigh, you're going to want to stay good with God. Love God, love your neighbor. Doesn't matter if you give away everything. Tomorrow, everything's going to be gone anyway. So there's something to be said for it. You know, th there's an old saying that there's nothing that focuses the mind like death in the morning. And so uh, if, if your theology is based on that, you're going to stay focused yeah so you think jesus actually taught that or it's a method of just carrot and stick no i think i think jesus did yeah i think <laughs> i really think he believed that um you know i i know i'm gonna get hate mail about this but um i don't really think if you strip away all the additions of the scriptures and all that stuff what you're le left with was he is messiah well that means the anointed one but there were several anointed ones. You know, David, King David was uh, anointed. Uh, you know, so Jesus was anointed by God. It does not mean that he was uh, divine. Uh, I, I don't believe in the Trinity. Um, there, there is a, a, a thought that Jesus came into his own at baptism. Um, the writer of that particular scripture said that the heavens ripped open and a dove descended on Jesus and a voice came down and said, in my beloved, son, this is, you are my beloved son. Today I have begotten you. Now that was changed to uh, today. Uh, you, you are my begotten son in whom I am well pleased is what it's placed in now. But it was actually quoting uh, Psalms 2-7 from the very beginning. Now, there's a, a, a line of thinking at that particular time that Jesus was purely mortal until the baptism when God basically anointed him with the Holy Spirit and his ministry began. And before that, he did not do any miracles or preach much, but he took off. And so at that particular time, they believed that Jesus came... Christ. 
to do away with that thing that they thought was a heresy, they changed the wording of that particular uh, scripture from today I have begotten you to in whom I am well pleased. Okay. So it shows you how, well, we don't know. It goes back so far that, that we aren't really sure what happened. Okay. It's like the uh, end of Mark, the end of Mark where it says uh, they'll heal the sick, raise the dead. Serpents will bite them and they won't be phased and they'll drink poison and won't be harmed. None of that existed in the original in, in the old text. And it ends up with uh, Jesus appearing to the women and the women uh, running off because they didn't think that anybody would believe them, but they were rejoicing. They, they left. Some scribe said, well, that's kind of flat. Let's add something to it. And so he wrote this kind of, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, a, a few paragraphs of praise that says you'll heal the sick and raise the dead and, you know, all of that stuff. So it, it's kind of a, a cheer cup to go out there and, and do it because you got the power. Yeah, that, that seems so, to be the theme, uh, right? We moved away from the law and into showmanship. Yeah. And and that is why up the road here where you and I live, every year somebody dies of handling snakes and getting bit. And what they say, well, it's because they didn't have faith. No, it's because it wasn't in the original scriptures to begin with. Right. It's not something you should probably do, you know.